You wanted to talk about uh, a tweet from Tom Clancy in terms of how Limerick um, was killed off the game at the end. Yeah, no, I did. Um, you know, it's actually just it's it's about it's about Nicky Quaid's contact lens slash collar slash chest chest issue because he was kind of looking at his chest as well. But Tom Clancy just made a, a tweet. I think it was interesting. So the Quaid stoppage timeline. So Galway pointed a free at twenty four twenty nine. Um, it was re- Quaid went down. It was restarted after a stoppage. Seventy three seconds there. So people are just saying that the game completely changed on. Quaid going down. So the next five minutes, Galway won the next ball. Whelan hit wide. Seamus Flanagan was hooked. Galway had a free. Um, Dave, uh, uh, Ronan Glennon fist pump. Barry Nash had a wide. That was Limerick seven wide. Limerick had a free. They were Burns for a pint. And then Concanon had the goal chance with that brilliant Casey block from. And I don't know how much he knew about it, but he had an active hurl and had it there and gave himself a chance to block it. Um, so in the five minutes after Quaid's issue, you know, it didn't have that much of an impact, but it clearly reorganised things on the pitch. You were there; I was watching it at home, so I didn't see. But when Quaid was down, like have you seen, many people making their way onto the pitch, or physio, or you know, is the is physio in? What's Kylie doing? What's Canerp doing? Because they clearly used that minute pretty well, even though the five minutes thereafter would suggest that you know it didn't have an instant impact, but they definitely reorganised pretty quick after. Yeah, I'd, I'll be honest with you, I couldn't quite see. I was trying to figure out what's going on here with Quaid, so I didn't really pay too much attention to that. But I know that uh, Henry Shefflin was getting very upset. And I wonder, did that kind of send... Like, you want to stay composed. And I don't know if going nuts on the sideline, and, you know, I'm, I'm obviously using that term a little bit harshly there, but, like, if kind of showing that much emotion on the sideline kind of sends a little bit of panic through your own team, rather than, like, let's try and get our messages across as well. Uh, what was a better stop? Mike Casey from that Brian Kincannon shot or Conor Fogarty uh, getting it done against Mark yeah. Rogers? Now, I, I think in Brian Kincannon's case, he was under pressure and he was just lashing a shot. Whereas I think Mark Rogers has to go low. I think it's unforgivable to miss in that situation. Yeah. Um, Fogarty, I think Fogarty knew more about the block maybe than, than Mike yeah. Casey did. Um, it, was a, it was a brilliant block. Fogarty again, just trucking along there, just doing as he always does. Not spectacular, uh, but just delivering, uh, you know, a consistent display again. Casey's block on the line had massive ramifications, I'd say, for the rest of the game. Mm. Galway would have been eight up, potentially would have went in. Maybe they would have pushed on or tried to push on until half time, and would have went in with an advantage, maybe deserving of how they played in the first half. Instead, it was really, really strange. They pushed up really high on Limerick and didn't allow Limerick build from the back. And then you could actually see the Henry go, you know, shouting in and putting his finger up that he wanted one man inside and everybody else started retreating back. And they allowed Limerick to build. But Darrow Donovan got on ball in the last five minutes of the first half that he was not getting on the ball before that. They were able to build, they were able to even get the ball to the 65 and deliver a ball in. I just thought that Galway retreated back, tried to, you know, hold what they had. But rather than going in six up, they went in one up. And you've been in the scenario, and I've been in the scenario when you've done all the hurling and you've dominated the team, particularly maybe as an underdog, and you go in one up, and they must have felt like they were losing at half time. And mm. I'd say it sapped a hell of a lot of morale out of them. And, you know, let's call it a spade a spade. It was a, a, a real no show in the second half. Limerick totally bullied them, and it was a rudderless Galway performance in the second half. And just that five minutes before half time and the goal chance just basically I would say nearly decided the whole game Limerick got on top and they dominated I think it was 118 to 6 points there from the 25th like, minute on yeah yeah like that is some that is an almighty hammering yeah after, after like I was looking at the first half an hour and thinking Jesus I tell you this could be on here. Like the, the green machine could be taken down here everyone like Brian Cannon was man of the match after half an hour Conor Whelan was getting on a load of ball um, they were dominating everywhere. Everywhere was everyone was on the front foot, and then I just I don't know why they seemed to pull back before half time. To me, that was the the winning and losing of the game in that five minutes before half time. I sometimes wonder is that a little bit overstated this uh, suggestion that they just sat back and I saw that uh, Joe Canning, who to be fair, um, he kind of backed Sheffield to stay on for another couple of years, but he was talking tactically. He felt that Galway oh, got it wrong. But throughout the first half, I was looking up the field. And it was like one or two Galway lads inside the 45 for uh, of Limerick. 
And what they were trying to do was obviously win ball in their own half and then deliver it up and sort of stretch that space between the Limerick half back line and full back line. Because whoever the two that were playing inside, they were more or less on the end line. So obviously you're trying to make sure you're as far away from the sweeper when the ball is about to be delivered to you. And that happened that like to my for my money, Limerick were trying to sit back and sort of zonally hold to some degree and then let the half hours and midfielders get tighter to men around the middle of the field. So I I, I thought that it's not massively that Limerick changed. Like Limerick in the early stages of the match missed so many easy chances. Like I'm just going through it here. They missed five of their first eight shots, right? And some of them are really bad. Like they were, fair enough, like Groot Hegarty missed those pressure from Ronan Glennon. But uh, Seamus Flanagan had a miss. He went over his shoulder with uh, Dahi Burke on him. There was good pressure there, to be fair. Tom Morrissey had one short. Keen Lynch had a very bad wide. Tom Morrissey had another one that was wide with Hawkeye. Dermot Burns had a free from 50 yards that was wide. I just thought that the, the scoreline was actually false. When I, when I reflected on it afterwards, you know, because we all get swept up on the, the sort of the, the hype of what's happening in the moment. And you're like, geez, it's on here because Cahill Mannion is flying. What a goal he had. Like, what a finish that was. And obviously, Brian Kincan and Connor Wheeler, these lads are on form. But when you look back at it, everything that Galway hit early on, well, most of what, other than Evan Nyland shot that was a bit short and Cahill Mannion having one um, that went wide poorly, everything that Galway were hitting was more or less sticking. So I thought it was a false position. And then once Galway, to, uh, Galway kind of had that storm up until about the 25th minute, I think they just ran out of juice thereafter. I don't think it was that they didn't push up. They just probably didn't have the energy to chase anymore. And also when they had a that, 2v2... That's a, bit un, that's a bit unforgivable though as well, like to, to be to not have the energy to chase anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, how, no, but, how, like, but how can Clare like, go toe to toe with Limerick for seventy five minutes for ninety something minutes last year? And how, like, how, like I, just, you know what I mean? I just, I find it hard to believe. How can Waterford throw everything at, at Limerick in the twenty twenty one All Ireland semi final and then be goosed after twenty minutes? Do you know what I mean? Like, are Limerick's conditioning levels that much superior that when teams go at them, that it takes that much out of them that they're they're gone for the rest of the game? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not totally disagreeing with you because it looked like that. Maybe it was a morale thing as well. but uh, That's the point, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think it is a morale thing. I think, like, the start of the second half, Limerick started getting scores. And as, as I've said already, some of these fouls were induced by going into contact, grabbing onto the tackler, and just flopping on the ground. And I think Limerick got the rub of the green more often than they should have gotten there. Um, I'm, I'm now, mixing up Jano, who, who, got, got who were the two refs walk. again. Was it James Owens was that Galway, one? And got, Colin yeah, James, Owens was, James Owens was Saturday. Yeah, it was James Owens. Gal, Galway got some woeful soft ones in the first half as well. Brian Cannon, yeah. went, look, Brian Cannon went looking for two or three frees and just stopped and got a couple of frees. And I thought, that's why I, that was another reason why I thought it was on. I was like, this is very similar very similar resemblance to Kilkenny in 2019 where they got a lead up and they got a brilliant start and Limerick were never able to get back at them and that's kind of where I thought it was looking but for Galway to fall apart like they did thereafter is unforgivable really and you'd have to say you know this, it places serious questions on them and it probably places serious questions on Henry Shefflin and what Galway are going to do going forward as well. Mm. Um, you're breaking up a little bit for me there I'm wondering is it the same for everyone else or is it just how it's coming through for me hopefully the viewers are hearing it perfectly but um, yeah the start of that second half like just after um, De Dermot Burns had put over a free to level it at 114 apiece Dahi Burke had a wide after being set up by Keenan Fahey then obviously there was that other free that um, that that was won that uh, Aaron Galan put over that was a Hawkeye free but then a little while later actually Tom Morrissey got a point. This made it 116 to 114. And Seamus Flanagan had surely taken 10 steps yeah, before the ball yeah, was yeah. off. So, I mean, a lot of things went against Galway. And then the goal went in. So that was a, like, obviously, I don't blame Park Mannion, who obviously he has probably had sleepless nights after what happened in the Leinster final when he kicked away the ball and Killian Buckley scored the winner. But I don't blame him for just trying to flick it away because what else can you do? Let it drop and, you know, potentially someone else gets it. And then at the other end, straight away, Dahi, Man Dahi Burke hits a wide again. I think that just killed them psychologically because you're you're such a gap to try and make up on Limerick in the first place. And when you can see the goal like that, and then you're you're hit a few wides, like two of the first three chances they had in the second half were wides. They had a couple of more killer wides. Evan Nyland has a wide from free that you don't expect. And I think that just kind of got them down a little bit. 
they were tomorrow. They stayed going. Like it's not like they gave up totally or anything like that. But I just think they were beaten from that point. Yeah, kind of, kind of looked like it. I would say about Parik Mannion, I'd say potentially if he had it back again, he might have just waited a half second and probably maybe could have got his hand on the ball. But you're kind of in that situation. There kind of is a bit of panic, but you do need cool heads to prevail. And like, what are the chances of, you know, Galan hitting the ball off the crossbar, it bouncing out to the right hand side, Mannion pulling on the ball, it bounces straight back to the one person you do not want it to bounce back to. And, you know, with a, a fairly emphatic finish, Galan was brilliant for that first goal as well. Uh, just kind of ghosted in behind. Like, Dottie Burke is, it's no mean feat to outfield him in the air. And I, I don't, it didn't look that obvious that he played his hurl, but he obviously does something at the very, very, very last second and does not make it look obvious at all. And, like, Limerick really needed that goal. Like the long, like the longer the half was going on, it's like, geez, it, without this goal, Galway would be miles clear. Um, and if but can I give you an example of a player that like is brilliant at playing the hurley without making the noise? So obviously, generally the refs they hear the click of hurley off hurley and they blow the free for playing the hurley. That's it. Danny Sutcliffe, I marked him a load over the years. Very, very good at subtly playing the hurley and it never makes a noise. And you're wondering what just happened there. So yeah, that, that's, that's, very, that, very good that's a killer because you hear a lot of lads, particularly in club hurling, you just hear it ash on ash and lads know straight away. But in that scenario, like I don't even know if Dottie knows his hurdle has been played until the ball is in the back of the net. You're not even you're not even calling for it. Um, Galan definitely did his his hopes of her, you know winning hurler the year absolutely no harm. He's just clinical with the with the couple of chances that that he got. And like we have to talk about it as well. Um, we talked about everybody playing centre back. Bar Willow Dunhu. It's 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 gas. And that was a decision that was made early doors by the by the sounds of things. And it's like Kyle Hayes going back wing back. It should have been more obvious to us. It should have been way more obvious. He plays that deep line role, um, covers for Hannon a lot of the time. He's played there for an appear streak. Now he was he was uh, he was caught out of position and was under pressure, I'd say, for the first probably half an hour. When things settled in, I thought he was brilliant and he got in a couple of his trademark flicks. But like we had Dan Morrissey. Kyle Hayes, Gerard Hegarty, David Reedy. Keith I wrote Lynch. an article uh, saying six options to play at six, and I put in, I put him in. So he yes, was, I I'd, say, I'd say he was number six. <laughs> but I just thought there's no way they'll play him there because they're taking too much out of midfield. Yeah, and he but, did take something out of midfield because his his loss was felt. Definitely early doors in particular, and Keane Lynch grew into the game. I'd say and worked very very hard, but he wasn't. Like he's still not himself, and I'd say getting in the seventy-five plus minutes or whatever he got will be massive. Come two weeks' time, and you'd be expecting a bigger performance. But they did; they were missing. They were just missing Will O'Donoghue's robustness around the middle of the field, and even there was space in the middle of the field that would never be there in the opening, you know, half an hour if he was there because he's just legs and arms, and he's great positioning, and he uh, generally clogs up that area. But um, yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see now whether. Hannon can get back for the final. Would you start him? Having been out for the guts of four or five weeks, yeah. going into a final, if he's yeah. if he's only like 70 percent fit, John Kiley generally, play. John Kiley generally doesn't do that. Um, well, and they, he's done it with Keane Lynch several times. Uh, when he wasn't fully fit. Well, he clearly wasn't fully fit in some of the matches earlier this year, and he still played him. Ah, no, look, uh, Keane yeah. Lynch is the best player in the country when he's fit. But come on, and he was like he wasn't fully right yesterday or on Saturday either. No, but I don't. I don't know if he's been. He hasn't. He he seems to be unable to let the handbrake go on his hamstring and just go. But you 100%. don't know that. You, like maybe no, he's no, not he, no, no. But that's maybe what, he's that's not one hundred percent physically fit. That's what it looks like. Yeah, right. Well, but he's, he's he's close to it. I would put it to you that way. He wouldn't be playing if he, was, if he wasn't if he wasn't close to it. No, but he he wouldn't be playing them. Like history would suggest. Like they don't. They don't. He doesn't put in lads if they're not. You know, near and full. They have a, a great bench. They're not going to leave. Uh, they're not going to leave. Be it David Reedy or whoever it was before. They're not going to leave these lads in the bench to play a lad that's sixty percent fit. And I don't think they're going to throw Hannon in for the final if he's only sixty seventy percent. Um, and I think at least they they'd be happy that they have found a solution that they can go to war with in the final if Hannon is not fit. Yeah, I I think that when they played Lynch earlier this year, he wasn't hundred percent right, and they were hoping that he would come. And then he wasn't even in the squad for the next match. So I, I have to say, I don't necessarily agree with you on that one. And there was a comment there saying that, to be fair um, to Shane, it must be very hard 
to hide the seeding of all, you know, at all of Limerick's success as a tip man. Do you think it bothers me that, Bernie, do you think that it angers me to see Limerick do it? Yes. Really? No. Yes. Because I actually have a few friends from Clare as well, and they're like, God, we hate G and Tip. And I'm like, we don't mind G. Like, we've so many enemies that, uh, you know, not everybody can be your most hated rival. <laughs> well, you can hear definitely your most hated rival outside of Munster anyway. And, and as you said before, uh, you'd be happy enough for anybody to win outside, outside of them. So <laughs> you're probably shouting for Limerick in the all Ireland final, actually, realistically. Well, um, I, I, I can't make my mind up. If they could both lose, I'd be happy enough. But I'd probably accept Limerick winning uh, out of the two. There I often know. said that before about Offaly County Finals that Burr aren't involved in. If they just dropped a bomb on the stadium, we'd probably all be happy. <laughs> uh, Adrian, if we were to go back to the other game, what did you make of um, like the fact that Galway just... like Go through the team, right? And I'm, I'm looking at the forwards here and... Evan Nyland, he didn't score from play. Brian Kincannon and Conor Whelan, they both got their three points each from play, but went very quiet after half time, as did uh, Cahal Mannion, who got 1 1 and then very quiet. Ronan Glennon didn't really impact the game. Keenan Fahey was very good against Tip, didn't really impact it. Evan Nyland, like people are going to slate him as a glorified free taker if he doesn't start taking over these games or start making a real impact. There was a period in the second half where he just got, he tried to take on the Limerick defence, fair play to him, but he just got turned back and dispossessed. and you know, they need more out of him. You know, they need him to kind of step up as a leader and some of these other lads too. And when you, when you know that some lads are probably entering the last year or two, Grode McInerney, Joseph Cooney is still very good. Like, you just wonder where this Galway team is going. Not that there, there's not bad hurlers there. And a couple of lads have established themselves, Keenan Fahey, Sean Lennon and so on. But it does kind of feel like rather than building towards something, they kind of might be missing out on their last chance or two to squeeze something out of this team. Yeah, you go down through the spine, you're looking at Dottie Burke, Road, McInerney, Parik Mannion, Joseph Cooney. Like, they're all either late 20s or, or early 30s. Like, time is of essence, you'd have you'd have to say. Um, it's just even Cotton Mannion's obviously late, late 20s as well, but a lot of their big players just went out of the game when they kind of needed it most and the squeeze was put on them. Um, I think Cotton Mannion touched the ball twice in the second half. Conor Whelan got on the ball very, very little as well. They weren't able to get him on the ball. In the first half, it was kind of like, just get the ball in anyway into him and the ball was getting in and there was bits of space. But they, they literally could not break down the wall in the second half. And like, tactically you'd have to wonder why they kept going long down on top of the Limerick half back line. Like it was ball after ball after ball after ball. I think it's panic on the field yeah. under pressure. Yeah, like but like they had they had the three lads standing in the full back line looking for the puck out. And that's not to say they all wanted the ball or anything like that. But like the idea of hitting the ball to the full back and the ball going back to the goalie and it been trucked an extra six or seven yards on the puck out. Like that that's not that's not going short. I just thought they maybe needed to be a bit bolder when they weren't winning that under under half hour line. No point saying any different. They had three men loose in the full back line. Try and try and work, you know, a, a one, two, a bit of an overlap. Get the ball to the 45. Give yourself a chance to get a ball inside. Give yourself a chance to work it to somebody in the middle of the field. They didn't do that. And it's almost like, I don't know what you thought. You were in there. I was just looking at it on the box and you're like, how are they hitting another puck out down here? How why aren't they trying something different? Why why are they still looking at this? Like, and the longer the second half went on, the worse it got. Um, and it's just mad to think that nothing changed um from a puck out point of view. You kind of feel sorry for Anna Murphy in what in one sense, because it was <laughs> didn't look like there was anywhere else for him to put the ball, or nobody else seemed to want the ball. But it was it was strange. The, the longer it went on, the further Limerick went clear. Yeah, you'd think that they'd look to work the ball around. Like, if Limerick have withdrawn, that they'd look to, to think, OK, well, where do we have the numerical advantage? And work the ball out from the back, draw a man, pop it over his shoulder, that sort of stuff, and hope that doing that will draw Limerick up the field a little bit so that then when you go along with the next ball, that it's a bit more impactful yeah. rather than just, here's the long ball, Limerick. You'll never believe where this is going on top of your six foot five on average half back line. So, um, yeah, and we, we all kind of sensed during the warm-up that Hegarty was going to be in the half-forward line because he was warming up with some of the other half-forwards and you could see Will O'Donoghue um, warming up with the half-back. So that was kind of the kind of uh, the secret was out, I suppose, at that stage. But do, do you feel that all those changes work? We're talking about 
you know, Lohan and, and, and what he did with the team and so on. Actually, there's a there's a comment here from Palpo saying, it took the greatest save of all time to stop Clare making the final. Stop writing Lohan off, lads. Deserves another year. I don't think we wrote him off, but we did question some of the decisions. But I wouldn't say that everything that John Kiley did worked either. Like, Will O'Donoghue, like, I don't know if he was perfectly suited to centre-back in this game. I don't know if they got everything they wanted out of David Reedy when he was in midfield or Keane Lynch when he was in midfield at different uh, stages. Now, ultimately, Galway hit a wall in this game, whether it's energy, mentality, whatever. And, you know, Limerick stepped up and did what they've been doing for years. And I think they're psychologically five points up on a lot of teams. And if they get ahead, teams dropped ahead. But I don't think that Limerick got everything right here either. So, you know, it wasn't perfection. No, well, if you're looking at half an hour in, you're thinking, putting Willow Dunne who sent her back, you'd have to question were they Robin Peter to pay Paul a bit and were, was their midfield really suffering and were Galway making hay in around that sector because he wasn't there. But, you know, I don't, they seem to hold their ground an awful lot more. They seem to stop following maybe even around half an hour in. Maybe after, after Quaid went down, the message was get in that we're going to hold our shape here. We're not like... They, they were, were trying to anyway. They yeah. genuinely were. I was looking in and I was like, right, this isn't working. And by the way, sorry, I know I'm cutting you off mid-flow, but what Ian Murphy was doing with his puck outs throughout the game, but especially in the first half, he was disguising where he was hitting it until the last second. It was almost like he yeah. twisted the wrists as he was um, sort of building up to strike it. I thought it was really, really impressive. The amount of times he found lads totally on their own as yeah. Limerick were trying to hold their shape was really impressive. I don't know if you saw it. There was a video going around from when they played Kilkenny in Nolan Park this year and Aina Murphy standing to the right side of the post um, down the O'Loughlin's end and he's looking to the right side and he flicks a ball 50 yards to the opposite side and like a no-look pass and that's obviously the ability he has and it's just nearly a And he's pity. much maligned over the years, isn't he? Yeah, like, but, it, it, but it's a pity that that was wasted on trucking ball down on top of the half forward line like there had to be options maybe it was a, a lack of energy or you know their, that their their game was was ran by the midway through the second half but it's just disappointing that they kept doing the same thing over over and over again like it, straight out like do you do you think Henry Shefflin will be uh, in charge of Galway next year I think he yeah could I do have, do you I think he could quite a frustrated figure on the line I think he could quite a frustrated figure after just reading between the between the lines just my own kind of thoughts and I thought he I thought he was big and limerick up after um more than an opposition manager normally would and talking about how good Galan was and how good Seamus Flanagan was and how good Darrow Donovan was and this type of thing and um I, I thought that was peculiar from you know an opposition manager who'd just been beaten in a game and I know Limerick are the standard bears and they're a great team and all that but um yeah, I just I would have been disappointed with with you know really disappointed with that second half and as I said time is of essence for this Galway team and they didn't seize the day when they created a fair opportunity for themselves. And like let's say he did leave the post whether he was asked to or whether he decided to himself, who necessarily would Galway go for next year because Michal Donahue has just completed one year with uh, Dublin so I can't imagine he'd go back. Um, I mean, obviously, what comes to mind for me is Matty Kenny, because, of course, he's a Galway man, and he'd always be fresh in the mind because he was my manager. But uh, I don't know, would there be a load of options? No, there's not a hell, of a, lot of, a hell of a lot of options. And I think that comes into the equation as well when you're thinking of managers. Like, it's one thing saying, we need change. If the change is not better than what's there, then I don't think you change. So it's it's it'll be interesting, but it's going to be fascinating to see what happens over over the over the coming months. There's obviously big travel involved in it as well. And yeah, it, maybe he'll feel like that he's not got the bounce out of them that he hoped he would. I think they only won a Walsh Cup in the two years that he was there. They were beat and really disappointed in Leicester, Leicester final performance last year. They had the Leinster final in their grasp this year. If they had a title under the belt, maybe it would be different. But uh, we'll be following that one fairly closely over uh, over the coming weeks and months. Where do Galway train? Is it Athenry or is it somewhere else? Uh, I think the footballers train somewhere. The football, they train in different places, but I think it would be mostly Athenry, but I could stand corrected on that. Ballyhale is two and a half hours from Athenry. Like, yeah, that like, is... It's, colossal, no, it's a colossal spin, like, yeah. It's a colossal yeah. spin that has massive uh, ramifications of on other parts of your life as well, and your work, obviously, too. Yeah, like Henry Shefflin did brilliantly with that uh, Ballyhale Shamrocks team and they won a the couple of All-Irelands. Really, really impressive. But since then, and you know, that was a team that has obviously unbelievable generational players. 
since then, he's had a couple of seasons with Thomas Town, and they probably would have been expecting to get promoted, but they couldn't get their semi final and a final loss. And now, a couple of seasons with Galway, where if you were to look at the positives of it, they beat Cork with an unimpressive performance last year to win a quarter final. This year, beat Tipperary, won by, you know, performed better, probably should have won by 10, ended up winning by two, and no show for 45 minutes of this semi final. Last year's semi final, really good performance against Galway, and you can't blame him for, you know, just at the end, they probably didn't have the composure to get over the line, or maybe just Limerick are too good. So, I don't know. There's probably some some question marks there as well. Ah, uh, there is. No, I th- I think there is, and it's uh, um, as Jim Gavin has said, there's going to be some honest and frank discussions uh, in the in the in the, the off season. I'm sure. Just a word because I haven't really mentioned him. Uh, I just thought Dan Morrissey was brilliant the other night. Um, when there was when there was fifty fifty duels or even forty sixty duels to be won with Conor Whelan at different stages. I just think like he's not the most he's not the flashiest player in the world. But he generally just always delivers a, a 7.5, 8 out of 10. He's just so consistent. Um, yeah, and his his battle, yeah, potentially he might pick up on Cody in the final, maybe. It'd be interesting. He could pick up TJ. Those battles, we'll get into them in a couple of weeks. But uh, I just thought he was uh, I thought he was outstanding the other night. Yeah, Cra- Crackety Ash says, Tip would sell their own grannies for a player like David Reedy. He's been proper good since getting more game time. Would have a bag of all-stars if he had more time up to now. Isn't it mad to think that he was playing for Kildare a few years ago? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's absolutely mad. Um, it's funny you mentioned the all-stars there. Like, I think Conor Whelan is Galway's only all-star after the other night. And people would say, uh, people would say, um, you know, that he was quiet in the second half. He was, but I think he has enough kind of credit in the bank uh, up until that point. Like I, I don't think Clare are going to win too many All Stars either, and and I, personally, I don't think Tony Kelly is going to win an All Star this year, despite the three four against Dublin in the quarter final. But that's probably, uh, that's probably a debate for the other day, for another day. Yeah, do you know actually during the second half I was looking at the way Galway were up front, and the problem was they weren't getting the ball in the way they had in the in the first half, and a lot of the talk was how. I suppose Limerick sat back or whatever, but to my money, they tried to do that throughout the game anyway. And I just bring this up on screen. I hope it's displayed properly here, but this was in the second half. And you can see here, there's a couple of um, Galway lads here that are on the six yard line and the end line. I'm not entirely sure who the two players are, but look at that space. They're the only two players inside the 45. And like you can see Limerick's half back line is trying to hold there about 55 yards out. This was the case several times in the second half but they just could not or did not get the ball in. And a few times players, and I don't want to be too critical, but Tom Monaghan, when he gets the ball, he's looking to see, can I get my shot off, even in traffic, rather than looking to see, can I pop it in? And that was something that Galway did brilliantly in the first half. When a player got in midfield, at times they'd turn and strike it in without even looking. And that did not happen in the second half. And the picture that I just showed, I'll bring it up just one more time. This picture was there several times, and the ball was not delivered. Maybe players were tired, maybe whatever, whatever excuse you like to throw in there. More Which pressure team. on the, the man in possession, less time to deliver. Like they definitely but had more like time that, in the first half. I, but at times, they didn't even take time. As soon as they got the ball, they struck blindly and it worked. And that was obviously the plan. But in the second half, they weren't delivering it the several times that there was a one on one or a 2v2 inside the 45. Yeah, that's a, that's a killer, particularly if you're standing inside. You just, like, Conor William is in this, the type of form this year and even at times the other day that just get the ball in. Just get, it doesn't matter. As Joe Bergen used to say with Offaly, just leave it in good and ignorant. Just get it mm. in. Get it in. And if it's in here, if I have a chance of winning. If it's in here, we have a chance of scoring. If it's not in here, we have no chance. And sometimes, yeah, they were probably dilly-dallying out the field and a lot of the time they were swallowed up then as well. Dilly Dallion, that's a great one. Uh, Brian <laughs> Brian McNamara adds, lads, do you think that Limerick's first 25 minutes was a combination of Will O'Donoghue getting settled in as well as a four-week break? Once they got going, they clicked and blew Galway away. More Limerick than Galway. So that is a fair point, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah I thought I thought it was more Galway than Limerick now, I have to say. I thought Galway really brought it in that first 25 minutes. Really, yeah, really brought it. Well, they brought it, but how do you explain some of those really poor Limerick wides early in the game like we're talking about uncontested wides from 45 yards we'll say from the likes of Lee. Yeah they were there in the second half as well Tom Morrissey had two uh, really uncharacteristic wides within 30 seconds from two sharp hookouts. do you remember that? Just, just before he was taken off I'd say maybe yeah. they decided he was gassed maybe that's why they took him off but yeah maybe that was two so, puckouts yeah. turned over very easily. Just, that would have put another another nail into the Galway coffin maybe a bit earlier than it was actually put in 
Do you think Mikey Butler will be on Peter Casey the next day? Follow him around the, the pitch? Well, it would suit Butler, wouldn't it? Because, like, I, I, I don't even know if people in O'Loughlin thought he had the attacking part in his arsenal. Like, he, he <laughs> bounced the ball off the ground yesterday. At one the stage, finish like, after it wasn't him. so glorious. No, so. it wasn't. Um, he probably had as much of an impact on the Kilkenny scoreboard as Tony Kelly had on the Clare scoreboard, realistically. Didn't he win a, win a free or two? I think he might have won two frees, I think. What did you make of Tony Kelly's performance overall? Like to, to me, moving out to midfield was almost like, whether it was Lowe's decision or his own, I was more like, no, do you know what? Get close to goal here now. Get get to where, if you get your hands on the ball, you're turning and striking. I thought it was moving further away from goal just suited Kilkenny more and more. I suppose they probably played him out there because they knew they were playing a sweeper and they were going maybe thought they were going to try and hurt Kilkenny from distance. There wasn't much. But I ball. thought in the second half, like yeah, you know, yeah, I would have had it. Would have had him in around there. Would have had probably him and O'Donnell even in at different stages. He um, from what I could see, he never really ventured past the foot the half hour line at any stage and was predominantly out around the middle of the pitch. And in fairness, it was kind of like um, it was kind of like Philly McMahon on the Gooch that time. Like he's a man marker and you're supposed to stop the forward. But Mikey Butler obviously was told or got into his head that I'm going to try and put this out on the back foot. And he dusted him at one stage actually going forward, which very few of us would have predicted probably beforehand. Hmm. Uh, James Daly said, and I presume this is a Limerick man, Claire won their All-Ireland in April when they beat us by a point. Owen Murphy saved the best ever. Savage 45 minutes from us Saturday night. Going to be an unreal final, lads. Yeah, it really, really will be. P. Well 74 says, Limerick played with Dan Morrissey one-on-one in 50 yards of space, but Galway were unable to get it in. And when they did, Dan won it. And I think sometimes, actually, when they did get a ball to play in, they just didn't hit the nice sort of ball that really favoured the forward, where it was like 10 yards in front of him on his outside, there was a couple of times where it hung a little bit too long, and Morrissey, who's an excellent defender and is able to judge the game really well, was able to get his body, you know, in a position to nudge the man a little bit. And a couple of times he won the ball against the head when he had no right to. So there's a little bit of both of that going on. But like you can't, like how do you explain Galway going from being on the front foot, getting the ball in space, to just fading away? Just it's multifactorial, really, isn't it? Ah, uh, there's 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 a lot in it. Um... I do think a lot of it is to do with morale. Even if they've gone in three or four up at half time, you must like you. You feel very deflated going in at half time, mm. knowing that you're after giving everything. You're after knocking Limerick back. They had them at sixes and sevens for the guts of the first half, and you're going in one up. What did Limerick hit? Did Limerick hit five at the last? Did, did they hit five in a row actually? Um, to, uh, at the last points in the first half, they might well have had. Did it go from one? Uh, was it one thirteen to? One seven, one thirteen to one twelve at half time was it? I think they might have hit the last. Yeah, five. They, they hit five of the last six. Sorry, six of the last seven of the half. Yeah, like that's that's so that's, destroying. That's a killer. Ah, it is. There's no point in saying any different. And if you looked even at the body language of uh, the Galway lads going in at half time compared to the Limerick lads, Limerick had their dander up. They were getting a bit of form. Galway lads were kind of heavy legged, trudging in, maybe knowing deep down that. We Will O'Donnell who hit Henry Sheffield on the shoulder <laughs> on the way in? The two reds. <laughs> but I mean, like, if he's seen, and I don't know if he did and if the two are connected, but if he's seen Henry Sheffield getting a bit wound up by the Nicky Quaid thing, and then he's like, I, I'll, I'll hit this lad a little mini shoulder on the way in. We saw something between Stephen O'Hanlon and Kieran McGinney a few weeks ago as well. But, like, obviously that shouldn't be happening. But, you know, gamesmanship and all that, it's kind of cute from, from Will O'Donnell. He's probably maybe trying to get a bit of a rise out of him, maybe. Exactly, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, make him, because maybe Limerick talked about it beforehand. They'll get too wound up on the line, lads. We won't. Yeah, and that's the the one thing. And, you know, no matter... God, we were, had, had Limerick at sixes and sevens, and you just see Canuck there with the piece of paper and Kylie going back, sitting down. There is no panic, to be fair to him. Kylie's animated at times, but there's definitely no panic, whereas from a Galway point of view, you'd have to say, was, at, at stages there, there was panic everywhere. And they were just getting... So you're just getting way too um way too emotional about like little decisions here and there. And as you said about the Quaid thing, like Shefflin was going ballistic at the time. You know what I mean? And just what can you do when he say, say it to the fourth official and make them aware of it and try to make sure it doesn't happen again? But you wasting energy uh, and getting totally out of the game. I'm sure you've been there as well where uh, something happens in the game and you totally take your mind off a switch you should, should be making or something that you should mm. be seeing. I think Limerick got it. All right. I've never missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think Claire got a bit lost in the whole second half yesterday. 
case in point, the Shannon substitution, which would have came traditionally 10 minutes before it did, I think they got, and Brian Lowen kind of kind of suggested it much after that, he'd have to look at the second half back that was a bit of a whirlwind that they may have got lost in. Uh, the Shannon one just begs belief, uh, beggar's belief because they were at times left with two smaller men inside and nothing but Kilkenny Giants around. And Shannon is probably the one man, I mean, yes, Peter Duggan, you know, TJ Reid, but God, ab above all, like, you don't mind hitting it in front of, like, there could be three men up against him and you think, he's got a bit of a chance here. You know, it's not exactly a snowball's chance in hell here. Um, Keenan to ref the final, lads, what do you think? Yeah, don't even need to give him a whistle. Just have a hooter to start it in the halves. I tell you what, uh, Andrew Sullivan said this to me and he was 100% right. I hope to God John Keenan gets it. I think he deserves it. Also, it will be his last inter-county game ever so he can do whatever he wants. Oh, does he pass the age bracket at that stage? <laughs> he state? passed the age bracket. Him and Paul Dwyer both passed the age bracket this year. So they're probably the two that are probably most in the running. But um, I think Keenan has... Um, leaned a bit towards what Crow Park wanted to do a bit more this year um, probably with the view to hopefully get in the final he has, obviously hasn't reffed one yet and it would be, uh, I'd be disappointed if his career finished without one so yeah I'm hoping John Keenan gets it How long do you give Cahill and Shefflin to get it right and Joe LK20 says uh, were Henry Shefflin's expectations too high, has he come to Intercounty too soon in his career, just a thought, well he had four years of club management done uh, at this day, he would have been, what, 42 or early 43 when he took the job. So, no, I don't necessarily think. I mean, how long does your sort of, um, I don't know, understudy or graduation period have to be? What do you think? Yeah, he's obviously won two club All-Irelands. You're kind of thinking, um, unless you go in as coach to a team or you go in like who did with, with Tipperary that time and get all the secrets of the state and bring them off bring, bring them off to Galway unless you do something like that and obviously he was he was by all accounts he was offered to, to go into the Kilkenny backroom team under Cody and refused and that's probably um, a lot of where the, the beef has materialised but um, I think you, you probably when you're you kind of want to when your form is good and you want to kind of just give Intercounty a go um, he's done that now. There was a question earlier there, you know, do we ever see Shefflin managing Kilkenny uh, in time? You'd be surprised if he if he wasn't manager of Kilkenny at some stage in the future. But saying that, you know, if Derek Ling wins in All-Ireland this year, maybe Derek Ling's reign will be, you know, it's obviously not going to be a similar length to Cody, but maybe he'll have a, a John Kiley-esque kind of reign where it's six or seven seasons. So you just, you just don't know, really. Yeah, I don't know if he will get... Like, it's not that he's not good enough to get the job or doesn't have the esteem. He definitely does. But you just wonder, when going to another county, do other people feel quite frustrated? You just don't know. Uh, by the way, Nash got a slap off um, off Concanon. Yeah, he probably should have got a red for that, actually. He flicked uh, in across the body of that. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, that was a tasty enough one. Now, there was some mm. loose enough There was some loose enough stuff at different times. Adam Hogan was loose on Cody yesterday now as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But listen, I... I, I don't mind about looseness from time to time now either, to be honest but with you. But people will say, oh, yeah, if this was Hegarty, you'd be, you know, you'd be slating him or whatever. I mean, I'm saying it should have been a red for flicking across him, so I, I'd like to think that's relatively consistent. You think and it if, would have been a red? You think that should have been a red for flicking across? Well, it was bad enough now because he got him in the stomach with the hurley, so it wasn't ideal. I know, but he what? I, mm, well, you, maybe an orange card. Orange, you know, somewhere in between. <laughs> you don't want to see reds. Let's call a spade a spade. I rarely do. I really do. Like Adam Hogan, that's an orange card as well. You know, it's somewhere between a yellow and a red because it's. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's loose is, is the term we tend to use, but it was the far side of loose, really. Yeah, I don't think it's hatchet loose, though. Do you know what I mean? What do you, what do you think of Limerick's throwing uh, during the match? I thought very accurate throwing of the ball. <laughs> there was a fair bit of throwing yesterday as well. Um, it's Gas David for sure. He got pulled for one. It's only when it's blatantly obvious that it's pulled, like blatantly obvious. Um, yeah, listen, I, I, I don't know what they're gonna do. I don't know what they're gonna do with that. Um, but it's either gonna allow a throw, or really, really enforce it. And they went at it in the league somewhat, and I think it might even be last year that they went at it, and then it loosens as the championship goes on. Um, and it's only the really, really, really obvious ones that are pulled now. Yeah, Joe, we have to give uh, serious credit to a couple of people. Derek Ling for getting this far in his first season because there is that whole kind of thought that maybe 
you take over a job like this, a bit like, you know, you take over from Sean Boylan and me, and they still haven't found a successor, and that's, what, 17 years ago or something. You take over uh, from Man United and David Moyes, you know, like, you know, he's become a punchline almost. And then Brian Cody leaves after such a successful reign, and Derek Lynn comes in and gets him back to a final and has maybe modernized how they play while he's doing it and maybe kind of matured a couple of players. And some of those he would know, obviously, from last year, being with the under-20s and winning All-Ireland there. But he's done some serious job there in, in year one. And then Aaron Galan. I don't think we've... It's just like Aaron Galan doing Aaron Galan things. So we almost don't even talk about it. But 2-1 from play, obviously added in five frees as well. He's a killer. Ah, he is, yeah. And he's in the form of his life. As someone said to me there recently, uh, what odds would you got on Aaron Galan being hurt the year around... January, February, when he was was a Creve Celtic, he was scoring goals for. Mm. Uh, do you know what I mean? You would you would have got fair odds. He's fairly short. He's fairly short odds now. Um, and his battle with Hugh Lawler in the final is going to be tasty. Lawler probably got the better of the the two of the of that battle last year. But that's going to be tasty again this year. Now we have a, a fully fit Peter Casey coming into it. Um, if Keane Lynch getting closer, Glenn wasn't I'll, fully fit last year. Remember, he was kind of bandaged up and stuff. Yeah, had a bit of a knee. Uh, had a bit of a knee kind of a bandage on last year. He still ended up with three points, I think. But Hugh probably got the better better of that battle. Um, we we'll, we could talk with the All Ireland final a bit more in time, but Kilkenny are going to have to really shut down those big Limerick players in the final, which they didn't do last year. Yeah, oh, I can't wait for this final. I think it's going to be skin and hair flying. And Kilkenny won't be as naive in terms of the puck out and allowing Limerick to do the bunch and break. That's just not going to happen in this final, I don't I think. imagine they're going to try and hold their ground a bit more. Um, and drop out because they were pushed up all the way to the 21, whereas Limerick were more or less out to the 45. Yeah, I, I think they'll probably let them have it a bit more now because Limerick are probably outside of Nash. Yeah, Mike Casey's good on the ball and Dan Morrissey's good on the ball. Probably not as good maybe as Sean Finn on the ball. So, like, it's amazing. The study that's going to go into it, um, uh, you know, you, you say you want, don't want to focus too much on the opposition, but you have to focus a fair bit on Limerick. Either that or you have to focus on the things that we need to do. and Maybe don't focus on Limerick as much, but this is what we need to do. But uh, I'm sure they're going to zone in on, on certain aspects of Limerick, Limerick's play and go after it. Yeah, crack of the ash. Obviously, a Limerick man. Only Melts give out about throwing. No, he Melt is, to... is a good one. There, it fair. is a good one, but he only wants us to give out about everyone else and just sing Limerick's praises, which we do a lot. Like we're talking about Aaron Galan here, so good in the air. He's become a sniper in terms of like when he gets in on goal. Now he's putting it underneath the goalkeeper or not giving him a chance. Mark Rogers will probably learn that the hard way after you know giving Connor Foley an opportunity to block him down. That has to go into the turf. That's something that I think. The difference between maybe around 2013 and 14 or whatever and Seamus Callan became a sniper you know yeah. he started finishing ball into the ground as well and that's what the very best players do speaking of snipers it's funny Crack of the Ash has been a good man to do a, a video on Twitter with snipers taking out various player players that went, that went down the very stages in this year's championship yeah they've been too. very good now they have been good Brian McMara says Ling is class and a class act too never loses the cool and seems like a sound lad pure gent clearly hope he loses but some man, obviously. <laughs> uh, Kyle Hayes as well, another great performance. Brilliant, yeah. I yeah. mean, like... Ah, Shane, the, the flick point, like, he'd know where to go and it was just, you know, a lot of louder lads would have, would have thrown it up and tried to get a little left swing on it and probably been hooked, but just, again, we talk about teams panicking and players panicking, like, that's, that's just coolness and calmness when he's obviously probably, you know, Physically pretty fatigued after making a long bust and run. Made a couple of superb catches as well. He was one of the ones, well, Burns as well, probably. They put, they put the shutters up on the half-back line and Galway just could not find a way through. And, you know, when he made that burst up the field and scored the point, like his teammates filtered back in to ensure that his yeah. position wasn't left vacated. Actually, um, on Galway's side, what they did was they knew that Limerick were going to try and overload one side and leave one wing free for players to just run across into 50 yards of space. Brian Kincannon was consistently coming out to the left half back position to ensure that space wasn't there. So obviously Galway had thought about this too. How do we shut down Limerick? And there's going to be a bit of that cat and mouse stuff in the final. I don't think Brian Cody focused on it as much as he probably should have. Pat, Pat Mulhall says here that tactics are destroying Hurling, but if there aren't, there are going to be a lot of them in the final. I'd say we've nearly every angle covered. 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. S- someone slated me over not getting a haircut because I said I'd get one two weeks ago. Lads, I have a lot of things going on and my hair is the least bit worried at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Crack of the Ash, have you ever seen footage of Kyle A's at club level? It's a total joke. Yeah, then, he get, then he gets stupid amount of points from playing the game last year. Was, yeah, it, yeah. was it double figures? I think it might have been, yeah. Uh, I think he's, a, he's an animal. And uh, he, there was a couple of times the other day where he just got that couple of yards. And once he, if you don't stop him at source, you're in big bother. If, he, if those legs start pumping, you're in trouble. You're on the back foot big time. I don't blame Grode McInerney for what happened in that matchup at all. I think the ball going in was so good. Galan's movement is unbelievable. And himself and Seamus Flanagan dovetail together really well. They'll often both go to some, the same way. Then the two of them check back and then they'll both check off in different directions. And obviously there's space is created in front of them because all of those other players, including Peter Casey, generally, generally are further out the field. But uh, I don't think anyone would be able to stop some of that movement that Galan makes. Um, so I, I wouldn't blame Grove. I thought McInerney did well, Shane, because I thought he was under pressure going in at half time. I thought he I thought he just had enough second half to be fair. Mm.